What is the state of America's health? Terrible. I mean, you consider that uh, somewhere approaching 80% of people are overweight or obese. Half the people have heart disease. You know, probably at least 70% of them are constipated. But yeah, we're in terrible shape. And uh, it's not that we don't deserve the health that we're in, because we do. But most people don't understand the full implications of why they're in the health they're in, you know, how they're being lied to by the food industry and, you know, medical business and so on. It's all, it's all profit driven, driven misinformation. That's all. It's not a conspiracy. It's just profit driven misinformation. And as a result, the consumer suffers and the profits go on. When you say that starch was the traditional diet of people, what foods specifically are you referring to and which people are you speaking of? Well, starch is uh, something produced by plants. Only plants uh, can make uh, sugar or they make glucose. And they do it by taking carbon dioxide from the air, water from the ground. And with the use of sunlight, they turn it into sugar. Some of those sugars are, are stored uh, they're stored in the roots, and they're stored in parts of other parts of the plants. Now, they're stored for the plant's own needs because after a long winter, they have to become anew. So they have to germinate or sprout. And that's why they store the sugar in their uh, parts, such as the underground storage organs, which are potatoes and sweet potatoes and bulbs and corms or above ground storage organs, which are your seeds in the form of grains and legumes. So that's why starch is there. And it's, uh, you could think of it as uh, plant parts that contain high concentrations of healthy calories, which are sugar calories. And when they're the plant, of course, they're in excellent shape. Uh, all, all, all large successful populations of people throughout all of verifiable human history have obtained the bulk of their calories from starch. Now, what we're talking about are uh, the American Indians who are people who ate corn. And uh, that extended down into Central America where you have the Mayans and the Aztecs, which were known as the people of the corn. They lived for 1300 years. They had civilizations for 1300 years on, on corn. You know, they had sporting events, they fought battles, they had children, I mean, for. 1,300 years on corn. And if you go further south, you go to the Andes and you look at the, uh, the Incas and uh, people living in that region of the world. And they're known as potato eaters. Uh, there are about four to 600 different species of potatoes in that region of the world. And uh, these potatoes uh, have provided the bulk of the energy for people in that part of the world. Except uh, kind of interesting when the uh, when the Incas went to battle because potatoes were so heavy to carry, they switched to quinoa. If you uh, go to Europe and you look at the breadbasket of the world, you, you remember in that region of the world, the breadbasket of the world. But why did they call it the breadbasket of the world? Because people lived on wheat and barley and other types of grains. And yeah, you know, bread is the staff of life. Always has been, always will be. If you go uh, further east and you look to the Asian countries, what immediately you're struck by are rice eaters. You know, in, in China, their, their welcome in the morning is not, good morning, how are you? It's, have you had your rice today? So uh, wherever you look in the world, what you find is that up until recently, up until recently, large successful populations of people obtained the bulk of their calories from starch. And the exceptions were the royalty, the aristocrats, the kings and queens of, of the past, which there were just a few of in the past. And now because of the industrial revolution and because of the harnessing of fossil fuels, we have a world of kings and queens and restaurants to feed them like Burger King and Dairy Queen. And, you know, it's just a sad situation. Even if you are what would be considered a, a less economically fortunate person. You know, the cheapest food available to you comes from these fast food restaurants which serve you the food of kings and queens. So you get the diseases of kings and queens. And some of you can relate to the, the fat king sitting on the throne with his gout and inflicted foot. 
and he's surrounded by sickly looking aristocrats. And, you know, it's, it's a typical scene. People have known about it for thousands of years. So the human being is a starch eater, a starch abhor, a starch -itarian. And until you figure that out, you know, you just you don't know what to eat. Nothing works. You're into the traditional way of eating the American diet, which is a meat and dairy center diet. Or you get into an offspring of vegetarian diets, which uh, are difficult at best. And these are diets that focus on non-starchy green and yellow vegetables. They go by the name of nutritarian diets. They tell you to eat lots of kale and broccoli and lettuce and all kinds of these green and yellow vegetables. Well, I'm going to tell you, this is hard to sustain because there's not enough calories in these green and yellow vegetables. You starve to death. It'll take 11 to 20 pounds of cabbage to feed me for the day. I don't have that kind of time to eat. So <clears throat> that can be a problem. Of course, you also have, uh, well, we could get into vegetarians in general. They're, they're, they're a spectrum all the way from chicken and fish eating vegetarians to uh, uh, vegetarians who live on all kinds of junk food. So starch is the diet for people. What are the major problems with animal foods? Uh, animal foods, the problem, maybe the major problem with animal foods is that we are not designed as an animal food eater. Oh, that's where it all starts. You probably heard the cliches about the teeth and and the claws, and you know, there are all kinds of things that you can put us into a category of being an herbivorous animal. I mean, everything about us is herbivorous. So the main problem with eating uh, cat food, Tyrannosaurus rex food, is that uh, it's the wrong food for people. Likewise, you don't want to raise your cat on baked potatoes. The Humane Society would be after you, because that would be the wrong diet for a cat. So we start out in life and dairy foods are a big push early in life uh, with the idea that we can live on a milk designed for a cow. People get into big trouble because of that. Uh, you wouldn't feed human breast milk to a calf, would you? No, you get arrested. Calf would end up malnourished. Yeah, so that's the, that's the major problem. And then you go on from there. I would say the next issue is the availability of this rich food. Uh, because of, as I mentioned, modern transportation, because of uh, the harnessing of fossil fuels, we, we have transportation that is, uh, was once unimaginable. And as a result, we can get all this animal food to people. So um, we could go into some specifics, like we say, well, animal food has no dietary fiber. And you know you need fiber, at least for your bowels. And you can say that no, animal foods do not contain carbohydrate. There are, there are exceptions. One is milk, has some carbohydrate, but the cow gets that carbohydrate from the grass blades. Not from, the cow can't make carbohydrate. And the honeybee, and the honeybee of course gets uh, its uh, sweetness from the nectar of uh, the flower. So really no animal makes carbohydrate at all and you need carbohydrate for activity. We could pick on things with animal foods such as cholesterol. Uh, only animal foods contain a significant amount of cholesterol. We could talk about the, uh, the bioaccumulation of pesticides and other environmental chemicals. As you move up the food chain to the animal foods, you end up concentrating your, your poisons in your environment thousands fold. And then we could also discuss the fact that uh, we can catch animal diseases. Yeah, you know, you, you read about uh, E. coli and little children getting poisoned by E. coli on the apples up in, up in the Seattle area about 20 years ago. And you read about the, the melons in Europe a few years back that were contaminated with listeria. And so you, you, you see these newspaper articles and they don't mention they don't mention that the plants are an innocent bystander. You only get these animal diseases from other animals. Like a farm worker walked through your field and pooped on your cabbage, or a cow did the same thing, or it got contaminated in the, uh, in the processing plants. So uh, animal foods you will give you animal diseases, and you can get sick, very sick from these, die. And uh, whereas plants, plants, you can't catch diseases from plants. A whole different kingdom. Think about it for a minute. <clears throat> You have no friends with aphids or Dutch elm disease or tobacco mosaic virus, do you? Yeah, that's because these plant foods, uh, these plant microbes don't cross the kingdoms. 
Will eating a lot of cooked beans, whole grains, and potatoes increase blood sugar? And have you been able to get your patient's blood sugar down following a diet like this? Yeah, we've, I've treated hundreds of diabetics, and we publish scientific work on our treatment of diabetes. Uh, you have to go back and understand the basic scientific literature that was published since the early uh, 1900s. Uh, uh, Percival Hemsworth was a the principal investigator. They did some work, for example, in 1927. He had one of his colleagues, a guy named Shirley Sweeney, took uh, his medical students and fed them uh, different kinds of diets. One, he fed them a, the students a high sugar diet. It was candy and white sugar and so on. And with that kind of diet, when he checked the, uh, the glucose tolerance test, which is what happened to the glucose over the next few hours, none of the students were diabetic. And then he fed him a high fat diet. And I mean, it was really high in fat, the students, healthy medical students, and they all became diabetic. Now, Percival Hinsworth, he published the article that should have really settled the whole issue in 1940 in the British Medical Journal. And he published an article which showed that uh, you get diabetes, type two diabetes by eating a high fat diet, period. And all the work that's been done, scientific work that's been done since then, clearly shows that carbohydrate makes insulin work better and you could cure type two diabetes. How often? 100% of the time. By definition, type two diabetes is a diet dependent diabetes and is curable 100% of the time. And we could go into the details on why I say that. Now type one diabetes is a whole different disease problem which you have to take insulin for. And uh, anyway, the idea that, the idea that uh, well-balanced diet is a good diet for somebody with diabetic diabetes and that a high carbohydrate diet is bad for them is an idea that has been propagated by many organizations, including the American Diabetic Association. And it's a diet that guarantees all diabetics will remain diabetic. A recent study claimed vegans have more bone fractures. Is this true? Uh, this was done originally in the year 2009, and uh, Applebee's group did it. And what they looked at is they looked at British vegans, and they found that they had an increased risk of fracture. And by the way, they've carried this study out, and it was just recently republished, and uh, found that vegans had uh, more fractures. Well, it turns out, if you look at the groups carefully, that the vegans were strong and healthy and active and so on. And the kinds of fractures they had are the kinds that you get from uh, activity, not the kind that you get from having osteoporosis, which are hip fractures. They had no more hip fractures. They got the kind that you get when you fall down, you break your wrist or uh, ride your bicycle and break you know, a bone and so on. So I believe that's the reason. I went through a, a very thorough discussion of that particular study when it was originally done in 2009, those of you who are interested in seeing my words on this, you can look at my, uh, one of my 2009 newsletters and you will, you will you know, you'll get my full analysis of this work. And it's contrary to what we see worldwide. What we see worldwide as far as hip fracture rate, which is, hip fracture is the most serious complication of osteoporosis. That's the one you really want to avoid. You know, not, not, you know, we want to avoid fractures of the wrist, et cetera. But those, as I said, are most related to falls. So if you look at the worldwide uh, incidence of hip fractures, what you find is that in rural countries like in Africa or Asia that were once, you know, rec until recently underdeveloped, uh, and they need a starch-based diet, you know, rice in Asia, millet in Africa, corn in Africa. Uh, what they find is that there's no osteoporosis. I mean, that was up until recently. The diet's changed in these countries. You know, it was a rare to non-existent. Papua New Guinea, where 92% uh, of their diet was sweet potato leaves and roots, roots. No osteoporosis, no hip fractures. And as you increase your uh, calcium intake, which is, I think, incidental, it's mainly an increase in protein intake worldwide, you go up to countries like Norway, Sweden, United States, Canada, New Zealand, et cetera, you see a progressive increase in hip fractures. Hip fractures are what counts. An increased risk in hip fractures worldwide in countries as they increase their animal protein intake, which by the way, coincidentally, they also increase their calcium intake. 
I got to look at the whole picture, ladies and gentlemen. And of course, these kinds of studies uh, get a lot of attention because now I don't have to be a vegan. People love to hear good news about their bad habits. And if somebody comes along and say, hey, being a vegan is going to give you more fractures or give you B12 deficiency, go, oh, thank goodness I can eat my pork chops. Yeah. Or my chicken or my beef steaks, you know, just absolutely whatever. That's the way people are, you know. They love to hear good news about their bad habits. Are all whole grains okay to eat? Are there any exceptions? For example, some grains like wheat, barley, and oats have gluten, but quinoa, millet, amaranth, teff, buckwheat, and wild rice have no gluten. Right. Should we try to eat the grains with no gluten? Well, unless you have uh, celiac disease, which is very rare, it occurs in fewer than one in 100 people and probably fewer than one in 250 people. But that's a serious condition. That's where you can't digest gluten. As a result, you get celiac disease or, and or der, der, dermatitis epidermis. And uh, those people need to stay away from wheat, barley, and rye. But most people don't. And that's a problem because there's an awful lot of attention placed on gluten. And you go to the store, maybe 30, 40% of the packaged foods advertise no gluten. And so the dieter's attention is on gluten. Well, I told you how rare it is in, in, in real life. So you got all these people focused on gluten. And that's not the problem. The problem is the animal foods. It's the livestock. It's the chickens and the cows and the pigs. Because they're what's making people sick. And besides that, it's a dangerous disaster to focus on gluten because we ignore the main cause of planetary destruction, which are the livestock. Planet Earth will burn in hell before, you know, before people realize that they have to focus on the livestock. They can't be focused on GMOs. They can't be focused on gluten because these are just minor issues. It's the livestock that's killing you and the planet. Where do you stand today in terms of fat? Many respected authors and doctors recommend whole food plant-based fats, such as avocados, raw seeds, right. raw nuts, and olives. What do you think? Well, I'm pretty sure it's not a good idea. I've spent my career trying to keep people away from fat. At the very least, the fat you eat is the fat you wear. So if you're going to eat a, a high-fat diet, if it's nuts and seeds or avocado oil or whatever, you're going to end up with storing that fat around your belly. Plan on it. The fat you eat is the fat you wear. Uh, these fats also have some uh, pharmacologic properties. If they happen to be in the omega-3 direction, then what they do is they suppress the immune system and they cause bleeding. And uh, suppressing the immune system results in more, more infections and more cancers. So uh, they can have some very negative effects. You can bleed to death taking these omega-3 fish type fats, or the, I suppose you take flaxseed omega-3 fats. You can bleed to death. Now, if you err on the size of omega-6 fats, which were of course uh, very, very prominent once in the form of corn oil, but lots, I'd have to look them up, but lots of grains uh, hit the omega-6 fats kind of hard and so do the various vegetable oils then you're dealing with a toxin that actually causes more damage to the arteries than does animal fat. So, you know, these are pharmacologically active substances, these oils are. And in general, they're not healthy for you. Now, as far as saying a, um, a diet uh, which adds uh, extra avocado, extra nut oils, et cetera, to the basic low-fat diet that I've tested, that Dean Ornish has tested, that Walter Kempner has tested, that dozens of researchers throughout history have tested to say that you're gonna take this low fat, no added oil diet, and you're gonna add nuts and seeds to it based on what? Certainly not the kind of experience that we've had. And you, what you're doing is you're cherry picking some of the literature, yes you are. And uh, maybe, maybe you think that you can get to the top of the pile by attacking people as famous as Dean Ornish or uh, Codwell Esselstyn, maybe you think that's the way to the top of the pile, but hey, hey you got well, to do the work. Yeah, you got to do the research. You got to see the patients. 
you got to understand the bulk of the scientific literature, not that just the cherry picked articles that you decided to tell the public about. What is the health of today's soldiers? And is this a concern to our military? Well, it's nothing I have not looked into recently, the health of the soldiers. But when I did last time, it was pathetic. You know, somewhere as many as 80% of young men and women who would be eligible for military service are not physically fit. And uh, in the military, the figure I remember is 53% of these soldiers are overweight. So, you know, it, it worries me to say the least. You look at our American soldiers, say, compared to the, well, I don't want to get anybody offended, but say the, the, the North Korean soldiers. And there's a big difference in, in, in uniform size. And I think it wouldn't take much to assume that the, the, the thin, strong, wiry guy is going to do really well against the big, fat guy. So, yeah, I'm worried about it. I think it's terrible that we've sent our military out there with uh, – with less than the ability that they should have to fight our battles. Absolutely. But you know, the meat and dairy industry, they can, they can kill anybody. They, they got, they got, they got the megaphone they got the money. Can you expand on your thoughts on the impact diet has on the environment? I've had a, I, I'm very interested in, in diet and climate change. And, you know, I am unfortunately one of the few people who's interested uh, for example, Al Gore, who did the uh, 2006 documentary in Inconvenient Truth, which turned us all on to the, the effect of what we're doing on the global warming. Even Greta Thunberg, who is the young lady who has rallied millions of people around the world. She's a vegan herself, but she really doesn't push it hard. And then one of the more concerning things was a piece I saw last week on 60 Minutes with Bill Gates. Bill Gates, uh, who I've always considered one of the pioneers in public health, and uh, so much so very interested in the environment. Bill Gates was on the 60 Minutes show, and he talked about how we had to look at every, every possibility because we're so far gone as far as the global warming picture goes. We can't leave any, any idea unturned. And then on that particular show, he sat and defended his cheeseburger. You know... What you eat is very personal, I understand, but when it comes to destroying your children's future, I think you ought to try and see behind your own dinner plate. Anyway, uh, he's very defensive, Bill Gates is, and I'm very disappointed in him because of this issue. He said we had to look at everything. Well, let's look at the fact that uh, Livestock's Long Shadow, which was a WHO report published in 2006, said that uh, livestock accounted for 18% of all greenhouse gases. And that's compared to 14% for transportation. The World Watch Institute came back a few years later and analyzed their data, including a lot of things that needed to be included. And they came to the conclusion that the livestock industry contribu contributes to more than 51% of our destructive uh, activities. Uh, the livestock, we're talking about, about beef and pork and chicken and even the farm fish industries. And uh, then we have the Eat Lancet Commission, which published uh, some of their more important results in the year 2019. And they explained that if we're going to save planet Earth, and we only got a few years if we have that to do it, we have to pay attention to the food. You know, more and more people are coming out and saying, look, you, if we don't pay attention to the food, it doesn't matter how many clean cars that you put on the roads. It's too late, folks. And so we have to change our diets. And so the Eat Lancet Commission came out in March of 2020 and told us that if we switch to a vegan diet, we could uh, decrease our greenhouse gas productions by half, 50%. And other researchers that are uh, involved in this particular prediction say that a vegan diet can reduce greenhouse gases by as much as 80%. So, you know, we really have to use this card, the diet card. Uh, otherwise, we're all, out of, we're all out of cards in the deck to play. And nobody's paying attention to it is what I'm trying to say. And so I've taken this up as a banner and put as much effort as I can into getting people to understand the connection. We are destroying our environment with the fork and spoon. We're deforesting our, our rainforest. Uh, we're producing huge amounts of greenhouse gases. And it's, it's you know, it's got to change. The planet's worth saving. That's all I spend my time thinking about. I spent 44 years 
trying to figure out how to get people to change to a healthy diet to save their own personal lives. Since my first grandson was born 17 years ago, I've had a passion for the environment. It's kind of interesting, the same passion that, that uh, causes people to be healthy in their own right to cure chronic diseases. We published, uh, we published scientific data that proves that we, will, uh, we are able to cure these diseases like obesity, type two diabetes, arthritis, et cetera. Uh, in, addition, in addition to that, in addition to the impacts on the environment that I just told you about, also there's another impact on COVID-19, which could open people's eyes. You know, COVID-19 has been around for a year and it's caused people to change and to realize that we're capable of changing dramatic changes. And they happened overnight and we're alive and we're well and, you know, I know there's a lot, a lot of suffering going on, but we changed. And some of the things we did is we decreased our airline travel, good for the environment and travel on the road. And, you know, we decreased greenhouse gases by 10% in just one year. But the thing to know is that there's a an important personal card that people can play. You only have two tools in your toolbox to keep you from going on from mild to asymptomatic disease to very serious disease, where you end up in the hospital, where you end up on a ventilator, where you end up dying. Two tools, one is uh, public health, which is uh, you know, washing your hands and wearing a mask and, and uh, social distancing. The, the other tool that is too seldom talked about, just like with the other subjects I just talked about, chronic disease and the environment, they won't even talk about diet and COVID-19. We've known since before this virus came to the United States or Europe, when it was still in China, that people who have comorbid conditions, which are diabetes, too fat, you know, people who have the Western diseases, they're the ones that go on and die from this disease. Uh, you know, Anthony Fauci told Congress in the summer of 2020, that the only way you go on to more serious diseases is to have these comorbid factors, which we cure with a simple starch-based diet. So, you know, we have, we have three different avenues to approach this from, and hopefully we wake up. What's wrong with cheese? Don't we need calcium? Well, that's two questions. Uh, what's wrong with cheese? Cheese is a black a block of fat. You know, it's 80, 90% fat. And it has dairy protein, which is the number one cause of food allergy. And it has no dietary fiber and it makes you constipated. And it's full of infection. Uh, dairy is more infected than anything else that is sold in the food market. Uh, you know, all kinds of things, uh, E. coli, salmonella, all kinds of different infections. Even mad cow is present in, uh, in dairy foods. So, you know, it's... Uh, it's not, it's, it's not intended for people. And its original form was intended for a baby cow. And uh, you ask where you get your calcium. Well, that should be obvious to anybody who just looks around. You must get it from someplace because nobody has dietary calcium deficiency. There's no such thing. In other words, no one has ever developed a deficiency disease uh, secondary to eating a low calcium diet. What would be the lowest calcium diet? It would be meat. Meat, meat has almost no calcium in it at all. Dairy has a lot of calcium, but dairy has no iron. Meat has lots of iron. Hey, there's something wrong here. Uh, where do you get, uh, how do you keep your bones healthy? That's really, really what your question is. How do you keep from having bone fractures? Well, you get your calcium from the same place other animals get their calcium. All calcium comes from the ground, okay? It, it is dissolves in water solutions in the ground. It's taken up by the roots of a plant and incorporated in the stems and leaves and fruits and flowers of plants. And then animals come and eat the plants. No animal eats ground. So that's how we get our calcium. The same place as an elephant, a giraffe. You know, we get it from plants. It's, it's, there's no such thing as dietary calcium deficiency. Now you ask, what about these rotten bones that people have, this osteoporosis? Well, this is due to a high intake of animal foods. Whole nother discussion. But when you eat a high animal food diet, you eat a high acid diet and the bones neutralize the acid and they dissolve and you lose bone strength and you develop uh, calcium-based kidney stones. 
What's wrong with yogurt? Yogurt's just another dairy product. What's right with it? You throw a bunch of bacteria in it. You know, uh, you put uh, acidophilus bacteria. Anyway, you put bacteria in it. And, and these bacteria, you know, are really important uh, for you, but you need a whole spectrum of bacteria, not just the ones that are present in yogurt. Uh, the bacteria is, are very important, but the kind of bacteria that grow in your intestine depend upon what you feed it. And if you feed your bacteria healthy things like starches, vegetables, and fruits, then you grow bacteria that, that supports your health, your immune system. If you eat a high animal food diet, you develop what we call clostridia or gram-positive bacteria, which uh, produce carcinogens and uh, cause all kinds of havoc in the system. So uh, to get good bacteria to grow, you need to feed it properly. Back to the food, isn't it? And as far as taking any, any extra bacterial supplements, uh, probably not necessary. Uh, probably not necessary. So, so where should, do we need probiotics and where should we get them? Well, you, the whole world is full of probiotics, or excuse me, prebi no, probiotics, uh, bacteria. And the, of course, you can buy prebiotics in the store, which are the sugars that I just talked to you about that come from carbohydrates. Uh, probably if you wanted to seek out the healthiest probiotics, you would go to Africa and eat rural African poop because, uh, and actually there's actually manufacturing going on in this area. And you may be able to buy rural African poop soon because the rural Africans are one of the last group of people, large group of people that avoided the traditional Western diseases. They had, back before 19, probably 1980, they had uh, no gallbladder disease, no obesity, no colon cancer, no multiple sclerosis, no rheumatoid, no heart disease, none of these diseases. And uh, scientists, of course, studied this and realized this. And of course, the rural Africans eat a starch-based diet. Well, uh, what, right, what scientists are focusing now are the bacteria in these rural African stools with the idea that all you have to do is isolate the bacteria of these healthy people and feed it to unhealthy Americans and they'll get well. Never going to happen. But if you're interested in the best poop available, you get it from rural Africa. A chapter in your book was called The USDA and the Politics of Starch. Please explain what this was about. Well, I'm not sure I remember exactly what that was about, but you know, it's been politics along the way. And uh, I think it started with the Surgeon General's report on tobacco and health. That was Luther Terry in 1964. He, he wrote this, uh, uh, this commentary that changed the world. Back before 1964, half the population smoked in this country. And since then, intelligent people in particular have quit smoking. So uh, Luther Terry changed the world by his, uh, his Surgeon General's report. Well, a similar effort was uh, made by uh, George McGovern, the... Uh, the senator from South Dakota. And what he did is he put out a document that was supposed to be similar to the Surgeon General's report in 1964. It was called the Dietary Goals of the United States. And that came out in February of 1977. Before the end of the year, the meat and dairy lobbyists and their money had completely changed the goals around. So that it favored eating meat and dairy. And ever since then, they've had horrendous influence uh, one of the things that they did back in 1977 is they removed the word starch from your vocabulary. <clears throat> Instead, they called it complex carbohydrate. You know, prior to that, you could go to grandma's and find out what kind of starch you were having, potatoes, rice, corn, so on. But with the changing of the name from starch to complex carbohydrate, what's a complex carbohydrate? And uh, in these same dietary guidelines and goals, what they talk about, they don't talk about meat and dairy being bad for you, eating poultry, making you sick. What they talk about is foods high in cholesterol and saturated fat. Again, you can't identify those foods. No, they don't relate to you. So the USDA, for example, is uh, part of their assignment is to, uh, is to give guidance to the public on what to eat to stay healthy. So they have the dietary goals from 1977, the dietary guidelines every five years. But their job is also to keep businesses healthy, the agribusinesses. And the agribusinesses seem to have more influence on the actions of the USDA than do the interest in public health. 
you know, it's a schizophrenic organization. Politics is a big deal. You have tremendous influence, lobbying, campaign donations, et cetera, from the meat and dairy industry. And you know what? They seem to side with the medical industries and the pharmaceutical industries in most of the debates. I wonder why. What would be the perfect diet if someone is willing to do whatever it takes to heal their body? You know, I, I get this question about the perfect diet or, or more commonly, because I'm a real doctor, I see real patients. More commonly, I'll have somebody go through my live-in program, which by the way, is a telehealth, telemedicine program now that people from all over the world take. It's called the 12-day uh, McDougal program. And uh, I get a chance to take care of all kinds of people. I took care of 6,000 people in residential settings uh, in California, both at St. Helena Hospital and at our resort in Santa Rosa. I took care of 6,000 people. And I'll tell you, some of these people are very desperate when they come and they leave very desperate. And you know, often the whole program is just way too much for them because of where they came from and the little they knew. And they leave sometimes with a diagnosis of cancer all over their body or dying of heart disease. And they, you know, I'll look at them and say, you know, you really have not done a lot as far as figuring out how to, uh, how to fix the food, have you? And I say, to tell them this, I say, look, why don't you just eat sweet potatoes and broccoli until you figure it out? Because you can live on sweet potatoes alone or regular potatoes alone. It gives you everything you need. Uh, so seriously, I mean, somebody as desperate as say dying of breast cancer, I would think that would be a good tip. And if you ask for the perfect diet, I went through an exercise one time called the optimal diet, where I eliminated various foods because they had gluten or potatoes because they had solanine, et cetera, et cetera. And I came out with uh, sweet potatoes and a diet of cooked green and yellow vegetables. That would be about as perfect as I think you could get. Should we eat brown rice? Should we be concerned about reports that there's arsenic in it? Uh, two questions. Should we eat brown rice? Uh, I think it's preferable. We serve brown rice at our clinic. But we also served white rice at our adventure trips because it was a bit of vacation. Uh, brown rice has some positive things uh, in over white rice. You take the, the coating off the brown rice, you lose some vitamins and, of course, the, some of the dietary fiber. But... You know, quite honestly, I just want to win the war. I don't need to win every battle until I tell people, look, if, if, if brown rice or white rice is the a deal breaker, let, let's just have the white rice, okay? Because it's not a deal breaker. After all, there were once 2 billion Asians before 1980 who got 90% of their calories from white rice and they did just fine. So, you know, I kind of make that compromise. As far as the arsenic goes, there's a whole story about this and you can again find it one of my newsletters just sent her arsenic uh, in the search engine, a whole discussion about uh, the arsenic in rice. You don't want to eat arsenic, but Consumers Reports, which uh, published the article on ars arsenic and rice, the year before they published another report on fruit juice, which had more arsenic in than the rice did. I don't know why they didn't publicize that one. Uh, the way you get the arsenic in the rice is uh, it's grown in contaminated fields. For example, a lot of the rice comes from Louisiana where they used to raise cotton and to kill the bull weevils, they put arsenic in the fields. That's how the arsenic got there. And so now you go, you take and you raise your, you grow your rice on uh, contaminated fields. What do you expect? Yeah, it, you know, yeah, rice is a, a little bit of a hyper accumulator, not like, not like cruciferous vegetables are. They're real hyper accumulators of seriously toxin, toxic metals. So uh, what should you do? I think you should try and eat clean rice. Uh, you eat rice that wasn't grown on these contaminated fields. And there are some manufacturers who make an effort to tell you about the arsenic issue. You should not stop eating rice. Rice is a wonderful food. Clean rice is even better. Is there a way to stop cancer from spreading if you have it and prevent it from coming back for people in remission? Well, you know, uh, cancer is thought about as a runaway train. You can't stop it. And uh, that's because in most cases, uh, it's not stopped if it's a serious cancer. The patients go on to die of it. And it's a very serious problem, to say the least. Uh, yeah, I, I am absolutely certain that you can change the course of this disease. 
And not only am I certain, but so is the American Cancer Society, who in February of 2015, they published their position on diet and cancer and told doctors around the country, around the world, that part of the fundamental therapy for breast, colon, prostate, et cetera, cancers was to teach the patients a healthy diet because it changes the course of the disease. That's the American Cancer Society, February 15th, I think it was 14th, 19th, or, uh, 2015. Anyway, uh, yeah, yeah. Some people get breast cancer and die 40 years later. Some people die four months later. There's a difference in the course of the disease and it depends upon the aggressiveness of the tumor versus the resistance of the body. And by changing the diet, you change the aggressiveness of the tumor. You don't feed it the things that keep it as poisonous as it is. And by feeding a healthy diet, you enhance your immune system. Yeah, I believe you can change the course of this disease. Absolutely. This is not, it's, a, it's a runaway train in most doctor's offices because all they have is a bunch of useless poisonous chemicals and a bunch of surgery that doesn't get to the heart of the matter. No radiation. You know, you're, you've, got, you've got archaic tools, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, I realize they make a huge profit, but you've got ar archaic tools. Why don't you get back to something that, that really is important, like the American Cancer Society statement on a diet for your patients. Yeah, then you'll make a difference. Then you'll feel better about going to work every day. What should a man or woman do if a mammogram, MRI, or other diagnostic tests find something in their body that could be malignant? Should they biopsy it? Should they remove it? Should they treat it with mainstream protocols? Or should they consider alternative protocols? That, that is too general a question. There are, there are too many different answers I could give you for that. I think the first answer I'd give you is you shouldn't go looking for trouble. So I don't recommend these screening tests uh, I recommend maybe pap smears and reproductive women and reproductive ages and maybe a colon cancer test. I might recommend that, but mammograms and breast self-examination and prostate exams, they're, they're dangerous, not just useless. They're dangerous. So you shouldn't be going looking for trouble. You know, we have modern technology. It's so modern. It's so uh, efficient that someday nobody will be well. For example, if you do 2,000 CAT scans, you find 1,300 abnormalities that you weren't even looking for. Be careful what you ask for. But as far as various early detection tests, uh, I've written about this in my newsletters on my website. So that's where I would go. It's amazing what you can find on my website. Free. What can you do to prevent dementia, Alzheimer's, and memory loss? Well, there's all kinds of causes of dementia. And let me just talk about two. Uh, one a cause of dementia is uh, little tiny strokes. And this is a slow progressive dementia. You get a big stroke, you know, you get a whopping loss of brain function. But we're talking about something that is kind of uh, insidious in its onset. A little tiny strokes will do that. And of course, that's due to the Western diet, the high fat, high cholesterol, meat laden, dairy laden diet. And then the other common cause of dementia. Well, the, let me just mention one other brain disease that's really well of, of, of great concern, which should be, and that's Parkinson's. Parkinson's is caused by organophosphate poisoning, pesticide poisoning. And, you know, you can do the research on that. Or again, you can go to my website, and look under Parkinson's under the search engine. Uh, Alzheimer's is a different thing. There's a couple of big articles I wrote on Alzheimer's. Uh, one that was re I wrote just recently. Uh, Alzheimer's is due to uh, aluminum poisoning. Yeah, it's due to, it, it, due to, why do we know it's due to aluminum poisoning? Well, it's because of research that started about 50 years ago. What they started doing is examining people's brains that had Alzheimer's disease. How do you know somebody has Alzheimer's? Well, they have a very classic lesion. You look at slices of their brain and they've got what we call senile plaques and neurofibril tangles. And if you, ha you have to see this lesion or you cannot call it Alzheimer's. It's a pathic mnemonic disease so that the pathology names the disease. You see these plaques, you've got the disease. Anyway, they started finding out that people had more Alzheimer's who lived in... Uh, 
areas of the world where the drinking water was uh, highly contaminated with aluminum. I, I did mention they ground up the brains and they find out, yeah, whether or not they had high levels of aluminum or not. Then the next finding was the, the epidemiology where they looked around the world. And, and they, the most undeniable causal relationship between aluminum and Alzheimer's came about with the electron microscopy or microscope. Uh, by dissecting the lesion, the, you know, this pathic mnemonic, senile plaque, neurofibro tangle, by dissecting this, what you found is that these senile plaques had a central core of uh, aluminum silicate, magnesium aluminum silicate. And you cannot have, you cannot have the senile plaque without the central core of aluminum silicate. And unless you have the senile plaque, you can't have Alzheimer's disease. And also there's some work that shows that chelating agents that drag aluminum out of the body will not only drag the aluminum out of the body, but will slow the progression of Alzheimer's. And again, if you want to know more about this, uh, just go to my search engine and put in Alzheimer's. You've talked about diabetes. What should you do if you already have type 2 diabetes? Can it be reversed? And what are the exact actions to take to do so? Type 2 diabetes, by definition, is 100% curable. Okay, you have type 2 diabetes where uh, you have profound insulin resistance. As a result, the body will often make more insulin than the normal person does. Just the insulin doesn't work because you're too fat. That's uh, type 2 diabetes. Then you have type 1 where the pancreas has been destroyed by an autoimmune reaction to milk most of the time, cow's milk. And uh, so you've destroyed the pancreas and now you have the spectrum here from a fully active pancreas to a destroyed pancreas. And in between you have a spectrum of uh, diabetes, you know, and I call this partial pancreatic insufficiency or type one and a half diabetes. And in those cases, you know, where you have the partial pancreatic destruction, you, it's not gonna grow back nor total destruction. Now, most of the people have enough pancreatic work, pancreas working that they run a normal blood sugar and their diabetes appears to be completely gone. Uh, the, uh, I think the thing that would convince my colleagues most that this is true is there have been many studies published on bariatric surgery. A couple of them I can think of in the New England Journal of Medicine, where they showed about 80% of people who went through surgery to cause a, 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 a malfunction of their intestine. 80% of people were cured of their type 2 diabetes. So any, any weight loss program will cure type 2 diabetes is what they want to come down to. And the most effective, healthiest uh, program that you're, uh, you're interested and likely to keep with is the McDougall program. We, we have research that was done at Oregon Health and Science University. A one-year study done on my patients and the, uh, the compliance was 85% of the people follow the program for a year, at least 85% of the, you can't people who get people to take drugs at that rate. Now, well, why did they do it? Why did they follow the program? Well, number one is, is really tasty. The food is really good. You get to eat a lot of food and people love to eat. And number two, the benefits are so profound. Weight loss, get rid of diabetes. In this case, we were treating multiple sclerosis. So, uh, you know, it works. Type two diabetes is curable 100% of the time. Type one and a half diabetes, sometimes you have to use a little medication with them. Type one diabetes, you always have to use medication, insulin. And besides, besides the same diet you use to cure the diabetes is the diet that prevents complications associated with diabetes like heart disease and impotence and cancer, et cetera. So you're doing a double whammy good thing on yourself by eating a good diet to cure your diabetes. Yeah, you can, listen, you can cure, I told you, you can cure your diabetes with surgery. You can even eat the Atkins diet and cure your diabetes because of the weight loss. But you can only do it in one healthy way that's good for you and the planet. What about eggs? Are they healthy? What about egg whites? There's a lot of press about choline and the importance of consuming eggs to get enough of this nutrient. Can vegans get enough choline? Well, yeah, vegans can get choline from plants. And that's where it originally comes from. Uh, as far as eggs go, eggs are for Easter. At most, 
you know, an egg, think about what an egg is. Egg is an absolute miracle. Uh, packaged within this shell are all the ingredients necessary to grow blood vessels, eyes, tails, beaks, claws. An entire chicken is put inside this little shell. This is a very nutrient dense organ, okay? And as a result, when you feed these very nutrient dense, high nutrient uh, foods to people who are already sick from overnutrition, they get sicker. And egg is, of course, is the highest cholesterol of any food. Uh, it's also high in sulfur. And sulfur contributes to cancer and irritable bowel disease and heart disease and all kinds of things. Uh, you know, eggs, eggs uh, as, as I say, eggs, eggs are for Easter. As far as choline goes, there's a whole other story to this choline. It has to do with, uh, with uh, a substance that's made, golly, why can't I remember this? Anyway. Tau, it's the, it's the tau substance. What happens is when you eat choline, the uh, non-vegetarians have a bacteria that turns it into a very toxic substance in the bloodstream. And I think it's TAO. Anyway, the, the mind sometimes doesn't get all the facts. Uh, so, you know, when you eat a high egg, high meat, high choline diet, you encourage heart disease by this particular mechanism. And uh, it's trimethylamine oxidase and whatever. That's what it is. TMAO. Okay. Is fish a healthy food to eat? Fish is a, well, first of all, I have a very personal interest in fish. I'm an ocean guy, windsurfer, sailor, scuba diver. You know, I'd spend my whole life. And when I first started to get involved in the ocean, when I was a young boy, there were a lot of fish. And now what's happened for my grandchildren is that 90% of the big fish are gone. Gone. You know, whether it ever grow back, doubt it, but it could. So if you don't happen to believe that fish is a serious hazard for your health, which it is, then maybe for compassionate reasons, you could give it up. There are only 10% of the fish left. If you're not into compassion, then you better eat the fish that are left really quick because pretty soon they're all going to be gone. Uh, fish is the muscle of an animal, and it is like other muscles of animals. In the case of a fish, it wiggles a tail. In the case of a chicken, a cow, you know, clam, these are muscles. And uh, as muscles, they're all very similar. And they have the same amount of cholesterol, you know, no dietary fiber. Uh, they're rich foods. Uh, you know, some are a little lower in fat and a little higher in protein than others. But a muscle is a muscle is a muscle. And it's a lot different than a stalk of broccoli or a mashed potato. And so if you want to be different, and my patients do, they want to be different. They want off their drugs. They want their health back. They want to be active again. If you want to be different, you have to do something different. You don't switch among various kinds of muscles. And of course, these muscles are very high in the food chain, so they're heavily contaminated. We talked about the microbe infections from mad cow to listeria to bovine leukemia viruses. Oh, scary. I think you ought to be scared. I think you ought to be darn scared. What is a food desert and what can we do about people who live near them? I, I couldn't speak on food deserts. You know, I, I can speak a little bit on the fact that it's just darn unfair that half the world is starving and the other half is dying from gluttony. You know, what, 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 a, what, a, uh, what, a, what a U-turn could do in terms of uh, helping both spectrums because of all this gluttony, we're eating foods that are very expensive, very high on the food chain, very wasteful. You know, you probably heard that uh, growing beef is much more destructive than growing potatoes. In fact, it's as much as a hundredfold more destructive on the environment. And as far as the amount produced in terms of calories or protein, et cetera, it's drastically different from say wheat, corn, potatoes, as opposed to animal foods. So what you could do is you could cure the diseases of gluttony, i.e. Americans, Canadians, Europeans, now Asians, Indians, everybody cure the disease of gluttony and you could feed the starving poor. Wouldn't it be an interesting world to have everybody fed? Maybe we'd have big, some big changes, like we could focus on the environment, you know, instead of all the wars. When you're hungry, I suppose it's hard to focus on anything. 
except getting your family fed. Yeah, I think there's a lot of social uh, benefits to doing the right thing. Are all fruits healthy? Are some too sugary due to hybridization and not being native to our area, such as pineapples, mangoes, seedless grapes, bananas? I wouldn't focus on too sugary, high-bred fruits as being a cause of any diseases. Uh, people eat uh, too little fruit in the first place, and the fruit they eat is probably a lot healthier than anything else they eat. So uh, I wouldn't focus my attention on that. You can certainly make an argument of uh, uh, you know, increased sugar intake, et cetera. But I can also make an argument that sugar ain't the problem. So again, I, you know, I try and focus on what really matters. And what really matters is that you're going to need to stop eating the animals. You need to understand the importance of eating starch, rice, corn, potatoes, beans, peas, lentils. And then you can get your health back. You can get your health back, your personal appearance back. Now, all the things that you dream of having are within your reach and then it'll cut your food bill by 80% when you do it. Others have said that heating oil creates car carcinogens and that we should never heat oil. What do you think? I, I think there's a, a, a good argument to that. Rancid food is quite toxic. And, uh, you know, that's why you, of course, want to be careful about having uh, free oil. In fact, that's why we don't use oil at all in a free form. That's one of the reasons, because of its rancidity. It becomes oxidized and becomes... Uh, a harbinger of free radicals and may increase the risk of cancers and heart disease and so on. So we keep our oils in their natural packages in the flaxseed, in the uh, hazelnut, in the walnut, etc. And when they're in their natural packages, they're protected. They have all the antioxidants around them so that you don't get into a rancidity problem. Except, I suppose, the extremely spoiled nuts and seeds you would, but it's going to take a long time. Can you completely prevent heart attacks and strokes through diet and lifestyle? Yes, you can completely prevent heart attacks and strokes through diet and lifestyle. Up until recently, there were parts of the world where nobody, nobody had heart disease. Like, for example, in rural Japan in, uh, before World War II, there was no, there was no heart disease. Actually, they had, they, had, they had strokes because of their very high salt intake. But there was a very isolated population of people that had these high strokes due to high salt intake. But there have been other populations uh, and that, you know, up until recently, they haven't had any atherosclerosis, heart disease, African people. Yeah. Is everything in moderation a good slogan for my diet? No, moderation kills. I can't do moderation. If I can't do it, you can't do it. For example, I, you know, I either smoke 20 to 40 cigarettes a day or I smoke none. There's no moderation in my life. And so if, if I changed around a decision I made October 20th, 1972, which is to quit smoking and decided to have a cigarette today, I'd have three tomorrow, I'd have three packs, two packs next week. You know, there's no such thing as moderation. The same issue surrounds alcohol for most people and other types of habituating drugs. And you know, for most of you out there who have food problems, you're dealing with the same kind of issue. You know, it's uh, one piece of cheesecake and the rest of the day it's down one buffet table after the next. You just can't stop. So once you realize that moderation is too hard, you stop playing that game. And, uh, you know, if there is any habit that I was encouraged somebody to give up, I tell them, look, you can play around for a while if you want. But if you want to get rid of it, you got to say, today I'm a smoker, tomorrow I'm not. Today I'm a glutton, tomorrow I'm not, or whatever you want to call yourself. Today I'm a meat eater, cheese eater, you know, tomorrow I'm a starch eater, whatever. You got to do it 100%. You know, otherwise, for example, you know, a, a pepperoni pizza is one of the last things I had trouble giving up many, many decades ago. And uh, I would dread when one of my children would bring a pepperoni pizza home from a party. That was a tough, tough time for me. You just can't have those things around. Too hard. We're only people. We're only human beings. What effect does salt have on our health? Should we try to include it or avoid it in our diet? Well, salt, in other words, table salt, sodium chloride, is a 
kind of a controversial subject. Even with my, within my organization, there are experts who believe that I'm wrong. When I say a little bit of salt is important for good health for a couple of reasons. One is you're going to eat the food. You know, the main thing that people miss when they switch to a healthy diet is the salt. You just add salt to the mashed potatoes. You know, it's no problem at all if they miss the salt. So I got to get people to eat the food as quickly as I can. So putting a little salt and simple sugar on the surface of the food is a good idea. Uh, there are uh, research studies, in particular the work of Walter Kempner, where he uh, used something called the rice diet. He used to even wash his rice to get the salt off. And it was a diet of white rice, fruit, fruit juice, and table sugar. Yeah, 93% carbohydrate. And you got profound drops in high blood pressure, profound improvement in kidney and heart failure. I mean, amazing. I use this diet sometimes. I call it the diet for the dead or the nearly dead because you've got to be in really bad shape to be on this diet. Well, this kind of profound uh, sodium restriction causes dramatic changes. But the kind of sodium restriction that it, uh, a typical patient is offered causes virtually no change at all. You know, you drop uh, 1,500, 2,000 milligrams of sodium from your diet, your blood pressure changes maybe a couple of points on top and a half a point on the bottom. So that's one issue is low salt diets as are typically taught don't really work. The second thing is, is that, you know, salt's probably necessary. That was why the taste buds were put on the tip of the tongue is because we need to take in minerals. Yes, and when we deprive ourselves of minerals as you do on a very, very low salt diet, what happens is the adrenal glands, they become more active and you uh, produce substances, angiotensin and other substances that raise the blood pressure. And in fact, we have medications like ACE inhibitors, and angiotensin receptor blockers, which are specifically designed to keep the, the salt hormones down. And if you eat a low salt diet, these hormones increase and, and they may be contributing to the high blood pressure and multiple studies, including the N. Haynes study, show that people who eat on a low salt diet have an increased risk of death. So don't take the idea that you're not supposed to be eating salt. And I think, you know, to err on both sides of the argument, and I think it's reasonable to do that, what we have recommended is that you eat our basic diet, which is about 500 milligrams of sodium, maybe 800. And you add a half a teaspoon of salt to the food every day. That's a lot of salt on the surface of your food, a half a teaspoon. And that's an extra 1,100 milligrams of sodium. Now you're up to 1,600 milligrams of sodium on the McDougall diet. Well, if you have a massive heart attack, end up in the intensive care unit, your low sodium diet is 2000 milligrams or 400 more than our diet. Low salt, relatively so, put the salt on the surface of the food. You'll taste it, you'll get enjoyment. And if there's anything adverse about a salt in the diet, then you won't experience those benefits, but you'll eat the food. Do you recommend for or against nutritional supplements and which one should we take and which should we avoid? I avoid, I avoid strongly that you not take supplements. They're, they're a serious health hazard. They're not just a waste of your money. They're a serious health hazard. And the reason is, is because they cause the nutritional imbalances. You know, inside your cell, you've got receptors for various nutrients to uh, work, to become active. They've got to attach to this receptor. In experiments, for example, on beta carotene, which is found in plants, and in plants it does reduce the risk of cancer. When it was put into pills and beta carotene was fed to people with a high risk of lung cancer, they found that those who got the beta carotene had 34% more lung cancer than those who took the placebo. The reason is this, is because you've got carotenoid receptors in your cells that the beta carotene attaches to but there are 50 other carotenoids that have jobs to do that also interact with the same receptor. So when you flood the receptor with beta carotene, you displace all the other carotenoids. So you cause imbalances. Like for example, in this month's Annals of Internal Medicine, there's another article and there are lots of them that show how taking vitamin D supplement, vitamin D supplements, you know, the old popular vitamin D supplements that cures everything, increases your risk of falls and fractures. I can show you a half a dozen articles that show the same thing. Why? Because the authors say, because 
taking the vitamin D in its very unnatural form. Remember, vitamin D is the sunshine vitamin. In its very unnatural form, what it does is it uh, causes imbalances to occur, occur in the nerves and the muscles. And the result is you fall and you fracture. So don't take it. Get some sun. Do you recommend eating the new vegan Beyond Meat Impossible Burgers and other similar burgers that are made from a variety of pea and similar proteins? No, I don't recommend those for a whole bunch of reasons. Uh, one, that's not the diet of people. I mean, people aren't supposed to be eating meat. I told you that. It's disgusting. You know, most people have figured out, at least those of us who become vegan, that it's, uh, it's nauseating to walk down the meat aisle of a grocery store. It's disgusting. It's not our food. So why would you want to make something that looks like it? I can't figure it out. And even go so far as to put heme in some of these burgers. So it looks like a bloody something. Eh, don't get it. Uh, these things uh, may be environmentally costly. They certainly aren't as cheap as growing potatoes and rice and corn. They certainly are animal friendly. That's true. But will you ever be able to make enough of these kinds of meats to supplement enough the calories in the population of the world? I doubt it. You have to go back to the traditional diet of people, which is starch. Remember corn for the uh, folks in Central America, the Aztecs and the Mayans, potatoes for the Incas, rice for the people in the Asia and the breadbasket of the world. Remember starch is the diet. And that's the way we solve the uh, health and the planetary problems, not by going to fake meats. I, I just, I would find those very disgusting. What causes weight gain? And What's worse, fat or sugar? Uh, it's fat. The fat you eat is the fat you wear. There's very little weight gain that occurs when you eat sugar. Uh, it's because of the biochemistry of the body. The body's very efficient. To take and store fat, you have to, you have to get your, your carbons in a chain. Uh, sugar comes in the form of a uh, ring structure, which is very stable in chemistry. And so to break it down into this chain, which is the fat, takes a lot of energy and the body doesn't like to waste energy. Whereas if you eat the chains, in other words, the fat, it just moves. It moves uh, from your fork and spoon into your intestinal tract, into your bloodstream. And it's incorporated in your body fat. It's also ends up on your skin and gives you greasy skin and acne, but it's incorporated in the body fat and it's incorporated so effortlessly that you can tell what people like to eat. If they happen to like uh, margarines and Crisco's, if you, when you biopsy their body fat, you know, you stick a needle in their buttocks, thigh or abdomen, suck the fat out, take it to the lab and analyze it chemically, you find trans fats. If you feed somebody a lot of olive oil, you biopsy their body fat, you find monounsaturated fats. You feed them fish oil, fish oil, and guess what? You find in their body fat, omega-3 fats. Yeah, the fat you eat is the fat you wear. Uh, and again, to convert uh, sugar into, into uh, something that can be absorbed and, uh, or something that's, uh, that's transported and stored in the adipose tissue, uh, it's very difficult. The human body is very inefficient at doing it. So what, is it, what happens to all that extra calories that you eat, you ask? Well, those extra calories are burnt off in, in the most efficient manner possible, which is through heat. You know, it comes out of your lungs and your skin. That's how the body gets rid of those extra calories. It doesn't store them when it comes from sugar. White, white sugar we're talking about, not just potato sugar. How do you help a person with multiple sclerosis? Multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune disease. And uh, actually the research paper that I recently published was done with Oregon Health and Science University, the neurology department to treat multiple sclerosis. And we got some amazing results. We didn't get all the results we were looking for, but we got some amazing results. Uh, multiple sclerosis is only found in Western countries, which by the way, <laughs> is pretty much everybody around the world now since 1980. And uh, what it is an autoimmune disease where the body attacks the, uh, the neurons, the, the nerves, the myelin sheaths the nerves. And it does it because it gets confused pr probably by eating dairy foods, or maybe it gets confused by eating the neurons of foreign animals. But anyway, it gets confused. And as a result, 
you have, uh, well, it's a little bit complex, but if you could go into the whole discussion in my newsletter, it's not that I don't understand it or could explain it to you. You have to break down another barrier, which is called the blood brain barrier to get multiple sclerosis. And the whole story is there. And it's all worked out scientifically in the 1950s and 60s by one of my mentors, Dr. Roy Swank, who was head of neurology at the Oregon Health and Science University for 23 years. He did all that work. But, it, you know, again, it's useless work. Doesn't make any profit for anybody to know this. Do you recommend statin drugs? I use statin drugs in my patient. Remember, I'm a real doctor. I'm licensed to practice medicine in four or five states. I'm an assistant clinical professor at several medical schools. So yeah, I use, I use standard medical drugs and therapies if they do more good than harm. When it comes to statins, you know, still the jury is a little bit out, even though the statin industry has done a lot to provide convincing evidence. There was a paper published in the British Medical Journal just uh, a couple of months ago, where they showed that taking statins compared to not taking statins by this particular analysis increased the chance of living by maybe a day. You know, certainly it's not very long that it increases your chances of living by taking statins and all, everybody knows that. In fact, uh, it is so poor at improving longevity that statins are not recommended for primary prevention. In other words, if you haven't had a heart attack or stroke or heart surgery, then you shouldn't be taking statins. However, for secondary prevention, if you already had a heart attack or stroke, which is when I prescribe them, for secondary prevention, and people who have a high risk of having a heart attack or stroke again, I pull out all the stops. I give them every advantage I have, and I think that many drugs, are, many drugs offer more good than harm to people. But percentage-wise, that's not very many. You know, absolutely, uh, there are a few. Yes, not, ma not many. Do you recommend a daily green vegetable juice? No, I don't recommend any vegetable juice at all. I don't recommend fruit juice or vegetable juice. We used to serve a little prune juice at our clinic, and that was to get the bowels going. But otherwise, we don't use juices. The reason is, is because... When you uh, take and beat a fruit or vegetable a thousand times with a steel blade, you do not improve its, its nutritional makeup. You destroy the fiber, you destroy the cell walls, you increase the amount of sugar available. So if that's, as it's an issue with weight loss, it's not gonna be helped by having all this free sugar. Uh, yeah, you, this is damaged goods. Now, can most people tolerate this damaged goods? Yeah, the human body's tough. And you can add some fruit or fruit juice to your diet or fruit juice to your diet or vegetable juice to your diet. And likely you'll experience no serious disease, maybe a little weight gain. Certainly your pocketbook's going to be drained. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's not a big deal for most folks. So if you want to juice, fine. But that's not where your health comes from. Your health comes from whole food, starch-based diet, period. No, not period. And walking around a little bit and getting the proper amount of sunshine. That's where it comes from. There's only three things you got to do. You know, go out and sun yourself and walk around a little bit and eat good food. Drink, drink clean water, breathe clean air. That's it. Very simple. We heard you in an interview say that doctors are bullies and that they bully the nurses and dietitians. Please explain what you meant. Well, I don't know. I've, I've had this experience hundreds of times. Probably the last time I talked about it was when I went to India about five years ago. And uh, there I was shocked to find that the doctors from the continent of India were more abusive than American doctors. They were more egotistical. They uh, more wore, you know, more the emperor wore no clothes type figures because they were trying to hide their frailty and their ineptness away from the uh, nurses and other staff. And they were more defensive than American doctors. That's the last time I said it. And... Uh, I think probably one of the reasons I was so much enjoyed in India when I lectured at the hospitals was because the, the, the meager people, the workers, I would often make comments uh, that, uh, that uh, contradicted what the, the authorities said. And I even went to the point of very professionally embarrassing a few of their top experts. It was easy. You know, when somebody believes in false gods like 
you know, the drugs and the devices and so on. Uh, again, you know, there's some wonderful drugs and devices, but most of it is uh, oversold. Should pregnant women take DHA or supplemental DHA and EPA recommended for others? No, pregnant women should not take DHA to reduce the blindness in their offspring. The studies don't support that. Or uh, EPA, and you should not be taking these extra fats. You don't need them. Uh, you get all of the essential fats that you need from plants. Only plants can make omega-3 fats. So no animal can do it. Uh, if there happens to be high concentrations of omega-3 fat, like osipentanoic acid or DHA, it's because the fish ate seaweed or algae and concentrated the omega-3 fat in its tissue. You might as well go to the original source, just go to the plants. A pregnant woman eats more food. They're hungry, they're, they're growing a baby. You know, they got 80,000 extra calories to get in, but that's only two pounds of protein to grow a whole baby. So they eat more food and they have no trouble at all getting all the extra nutrients they need because they eat more food, they eat more protein, more vitamins, more minerals. The only thing I do in addition uh, for pregnant women is I recommend that they have a non-animal source of B12 to their diet. And I do that for people who have been on our program for more than three years, or if they're pregnant or nursing, yeah, just to cover all bases. You know, it's, I wouldn't consider it a, a, all that important a recommendation, except it'll keep me out of trouble. You know, because it's the only criticism you can have for the McDougal diet. You can't criticize it for protein or calcium or omega-3 fats or DHA, but you can't say, well, maybe you get B12 deficiency. Well, it's not likely, but maybe you will. So let's just cover it with some B12. That's which is I've always done. What do you think about tahini dressing and nut butters? Do you recommend it? We don't. Uh, you see, I'm dealing with a lot of obesity. Uh, I would say 60% of our people come in overweight. And some really, really overweight. And uh, so I can't feed those kinds of foods to people who need to lose weight, which is the bulk of our patient population. If you happen to be thin, you know, I'm pretty thin. I don't see anything wrong with adding a little bit of tahini to my diet or nuts or seeds or avocados. That's because I could use the extra body fat and I could use the extra fat, but that's not the case with most people. Uh, it's not that these nuts and seeds and avocados in their whole form, you know, as a nut or seed, you start grinding them up and you change the properties. It's not that these are unhealthy. They're not unhealthy. But likewise, uh, they put them in, in really solid, hard to get into packages for a reason, because they're very high in calories. So, you know, it's rich food, folks. Why was it important for you to come and speak here at the Real Truth About Health Conference? Well, it was important because you have a, a different audience. And uh, I'd like to share with them my point of view. You know, the truth is simple and easy to understand. And when you listen to various speakers uh, during this conference session, you ought to say to yourself, hey, that guy or gal really knows their subject. How do I know that? Because they made it available to me. They brought it to a level where I can understand it. You know, you find people talking over your head with all kinds of biochemical formulas and all kinds of a really uh, technical stuff. You may say to yourself, boy, am I stupid? No, it's not you that has the problem. It's the speaker. So I wanted to bring to you a very clear message. I hope I fall into that category of somebody that you see who really knows their subject. The truth is simple and easy to explain. And it doesn't change. Well, we thank you for sharing the truth today with us and uh, for all of your meaningful work and especially for all of your time during this interview. Thank you, doctor. All right. Good enough. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Be well. Take care.